Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Mr. Kibbe, hello. Logan, hello. We're doing something a little bit different today because the show is called Kibbe on Liberty, and yet you very rarely opine on the show. You usually have a guest on, and you talk to your guest, and you ask your guest questions, and that's fine, but the people want to know what you think. And the reason we don't generally know what you think is because if you told the truth about your opinions, you'd be instantly canceled. But we yeah, thought this, we'd try this will, to, this will be the show. We'd try it today and see what now. happens anyway. So we solicited some uh, questions from our social media accounts and from our viewers of this show, and we're going to see how that goes. We're embracing, right the, we're embracing the wisdom of crowds. Yeah. So hopefully there'll be some good questions. Yeah, hopefully there'll be some wisdom. But I wanted to start out just before we get to the audience questions by just asking, how are you? I know you had a uh, couple of sort of bleak years with the pandemic and everything being very pessimistic about the state of the world. How are you feeling these days? You know, I was I said half jokingly yesterday that I'm going to be super op- optimistic about the long run. Unfortunately, it'll, it'll happen. The good stuff will happen after I'm dead. Yeah. And and I'd really love for good stuff to happen before I'm dead. And and as you know, and anyone watches the show, I've been incredibly frustrated, angry, pessimistic about the future of America since the lockdowns began and everything I see day after day just makes me more concerned about not, not just the economy, but this entire infrastructure of, of surveillance and control that the government's built. Um, but I, I, I can make a, pes- a pessimistic argument, and it's pretty easy to do, but I also think that bad things create pushback, and pushback creates a revolution of people saying, I- I'm not going to put up with that anymore. Yeah. And I've, I've talked about this a lot. Like, I think, I think there's interesting crossover, and maybe we'll get into this more, but there's interesting crossover from former lefties, um, real Democrats, people that, that really believed in civil liberties. Um, I'm thinking of a guy like Jimmy Dore, but I, the list goes on and on. Uh, Russell Brandt. Yep. Guys that are like, um, this authoritarian stuff's awful. I didn't sign up for this. So yeah, I think, there's I a think lot there's of old something. hippies who are sort of waking up to this and realizing this is not what they signed up for. Yeah, as, as an old hippie myself, I think I think hippies had it right because they their whole philosophy was live and let live. Um, I'm going to pursue my own path in life. And I think um, the new progressive left obviously isn't any of that. It's this techno-authoritarianism that's wildly scary, and they have all these new tools. So I, I don't know, like, are we living in the middle of a sci-fi movie that turns into The Terminator or are we on the cusp of some beautiful, bottom-up, innovative, disruptive replacement of government authority with, with individual control? I can, I can tell both stories, um, and I just hope I live long enough to discover that the happy story is the ending. Yeah, one time I remember we interviewed David Friedman, and I asked him if he was an optimist or a pessimist. And he said he was an optimist by temperament, but in, from a practical theoretical standpoint, he was neither. And that's sort of where I am as well. I just like I can't help but being optimistic because it's just my nature. But you know, it's hard to be that way sometimes with the evidence you get of the society. Which sort of brings us to our first user question, which is from Brian Darling, and he wants to know what is what do you see as the greatest threat to liberty that Americans are facing today? That was from Connor Boyack. Okay. Yes. As you say. Yes. Sorry, Brian Darling was a different question. Yeah, Connor well, as well as Brian's too. Mm-hmm. But I, I think Connor gets a shout on this, and I, I, I think I just teased the answer to that question, and and the answer is this vast infrastructure of control and surveillance and coercion that they've built. Uh, obviously, it didn't start with COVID, but. But this idea that you could force people to stay in their homes and tell them that they couldn't go to church and tell them whether or not they were essential or non-essential. And now we've discovered that the FBI and the CIA and all these alphabet agencies have been uh, monitoring and banning our tweets one at a time. Yep. Every time we told an inappropriate joke, um, that's crazy stuff. And then, and then if you look at the trillions of dollars that we spent that we didn't have, and, and how the Fed has been monetizing that because we can't really borrow much more money than, than we already are and we can't tax anymore. So we're just printing the printing presses and we're creating credit out of thin air. And the only solution to that is a, a central bank digital currency. Mm-hmm. So the, the way that they keep doing all of this stuff 
is by by creating money that they control that's that's worthless and meaningless but it's it'll be the only thing we have so that's if we go down that path we're pretty screwed do you have any thoughts on like what people can do to shield their shield themselves from the the inflation and the uh the economic devastation that are, people are having right now i know you know some people are advising buy gold some people are advising buy crypto like what do you think people should be doing to try to protect themselves from this inflation and and the uh, potential threat of a central digital currency yeah uh, carol roth was just on the show and and she would be a better person to ask that and i did ask her that but um i i think that one shield i've always called um uh, bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies a hedge against tyranny mm -hmm. um, i don't i don't know if it's a good investment i don't know um, what the downsides of that are but i do know that that fiat currency is becoming um, less and less reliable as as a means of, of protecting your earnings yeah so so one thing um, the other thing is is property and by the way i'm not a an investment advisor and you would know um, if you knew Terry and I, you know we're not we're not like savvy market <laughs> people at all, um, because I always again I think about it as an economist in the long run. Yeah. And you you don't want to be playing the market. You want to you want to make sound investments and stick with them. But the two things that we've done is we've 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 been trying to buy more crypto, and we've been um, um, holding on to the assets like like our house that that is something that presumably sustains its value regardless of what the economy is doing. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, let's go right into the belly of the beast and talk about the election, because as much as I have contempt for electoral politics, I think that this is the thing that's on everyone's minds, and this is what a lot of our questions came from the audience about. Um, and one of our uh, viewers has asked, what do you think the most likely outcome of the upcoming 2024 election is going to be? What do you think the best outcome for liberty would be realistically? And why is there a, a gulf between those two outcomes? Uh, there's, there's, there's a wide gulf. And, and, and speaking of dystopian futures, I, I don't see a particularly awesome outcome in this election. Yeah. But, I, but I'll, the, the caveat that I'll say is um, I really have no idea. And that's, that's truer today than it's ever been before. I used to prognosticate all the time um, when I was a Tea Party activist and we would get behind candidates and and we would break rules and elect people that that we were told by the experts could not be elected mm -hmm. and I thought there there was tremendous power in in grassroots turnout but the but the the, the waters are so muddy now like the question is um, you know right now Trump is a presumptive Republican nominee yep and I think I think his you know the endless indictments against him actually boost him, and maybe that's what maybe that's what the left wants to do. That maybe they, they once again like they thought in 2016 that they can they can beat Trump if they just get him past the primary. It didn't really work out that well in <laughs> no. 2016. I think they're serious this time. I think yeah. they won him behind bars before the election. Yeah, can you? And can th you, this can is you? actually Brian Darling's question. Now that I remembered it, is um, the precedent of trying to arrest people running for president. Is that something we should be worried about? Is that uh, just set us up for a tyranny of the majority? Or is it like good to hold politicians accountable when they break the law? I'm sort of of two minds about this, so I'm interested to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I think that um, I, I probably agree with Brian more than you on this because I do think that there's sort of a, it's, it's almost like a nuclear arms race that we make everything in politics um, potentially illegal and they'll tie you up in court and they'll potentially throw you in jail. And, and now that they've done this to Trump, I guarantee you that Republicans will do it to the next guy. And it has nothing to do with whether or not the president did something wrong. I, I happen to be of the school that I believe every president is, is a bit of a criminal. Yep. Um, but if, if we're going to throw Trump in jail, we damn well should throw Biden in jail too. And then it just becomes this escalation where more and more people are like fighting over over the precious or the it's a game of thrones kind of thing yeah it seems increasingly clear that there's this sort of pay-to-play stuff going on in the biden administration and there's a lot of corruption going on there and you know i don't think there's going to be any consequences to biden of that which and, which tells you that like and i know i know um some libertarians say yeah trump should go to jail he broke the law um but the, the law is so arbitrary sometimes and the enforcement of the law and the interpretation of the law and it's pretty damn clear that it's, uh, particularly at this level, it's all about political power and who has it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, they're using it as a cudgel against the other team. I, I, I think of this, uh, this point that, that Mike Lee made on my show years ago that 
the more and more power that we shift into the presidency and the federal level, the more and more we're going to fight um, literally to the death over controlling that power because we're, we're at a point where um, whoever wins the election gets to do whatever they want to the other team. Yeah. So if you don't win the election, you're completely screwed. And and I fantasize about a world where, where I, don't, I don't really know who the president is and I don't care. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. Yeah, I think that that's where I am as well. And like, I'm sort of looking at this upcoming election just from a pure entertainment point of view. Just like, I'm just going to watch and see what happens and enjoy the craziness of it because I don't have a dog in the fight whatsoever. Like, I really don't care who wins because I don't think it matters that much. So, uh, yeah, maybe just treating politics as a spectator sport is the way to go at the moment. But but that's hard to do, obviously. It because really is. If you look at, at what the Biden administration has done to us over the past several years, um, it's it's going to be hard to dig out of that hole, not only on a personal level, but in a on a countrywide level. The, the damage is real, and it's kind of a, hard to unwind these things once the government starts doing them. Um, but I, but I, I would point out, and, and I'll get back to the original question, was what is the likely outcome and what would be the best outcome? I, I have no idea. Um, I wouldn't count Trump out because people did last time. Um, Do you think one, he's going to be in jail by the time of the election? Can you, can you be president in jail? I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. He could pardon himself if he gets elected. Because I, I remember members of Congress running from jail. Yeah. Um, there was a guy named James Traficant who I believe got reelected from a jail cell. So I, there's a, um, someone watching this should fact check whether or not Trump can be president from jail, which I guess would, maybe, maybe that's a beautiful metaphor for what the presidency's <laughs> become. Um, Biden, it's been weekend and Bernie's a long time. So sure, they could keep, keep that up. It's going to be interesting because I genuinely don't know if Biden is going to be capable of running in a year from now. And I genuinely don't know if Trump is going to be a free man a year from now. And they seem like the two front runners. And if, yeah. if they're both incapacitated, who knows what's going to happen? And it doesn't seem like DeSantis' campaign is going all that well. Um, I don't know who else they have, really. I mean, there's there's people on the outside like RFK and the Libertarian Party and a few other people, but I don't know. They're yeah, so the, 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 the three candidates that I find the most interesting um, um, are should should be DeSantis. But DeSantis has gone from this this. Fed defying governor who unlocked earlier than anybody else and challenged the the tyrannical orthodoxy of, of Fauci and all those guys and and if if I saw that DeSantis right now that would that would be a pretty intriguing thing but but he's been um, um, kidnapped by the GOP and he's he's doing a lot of performative things like he's doing performative culture war things mm-hmm. and he's just not as interesting as he used to be. Um, uh, it's also still a long way away from the election. Like yeah. A lot can happen between now and November 2024. Vivek Ramaswamy, who was on the show, That's he's right. he's pretty interesting. Um, he's got some um, really big ideas that I like, and then he's got a couple, uh, one of which we talked about on the show that I that I really don't like. I he wants to double down on the war on drugs, and and it's it's. This is the worst idea that we've been trying <laughs> for a generation, and it's just not working. Yeah, it's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, now, now, we've also, you and I have, and, and our team, we, we talk about RFK quite a bit. Yeah. And um, he's clearly thinking about a potential um, third-party run. Right. Because he's getting frozen out of the debates, and he's, he's probably not going to overtake Biden because the machine is too strong. Um, but you know, we were at Porkfest, and RFK gave a speech there that I that I, I thought it was a fantastic speech. And he was at Freedom Fest, mm-hmm. and and he's clearly courting libertarians. And and at at a at a basic level, I mean, if you if you want to believe that he's changed his mind on some pretty f- important things, at a basic level, his position against endless war and his his position against lockdowns and medical tyranny, those are pretty attractive. 
I'd love to hear more candidates talk about that. Well, stuff. this brings me to a rather softball question from a Twitter user called Bishop, who says, is this the time to empower third parties and independents to run for office? Which I feel like I know what your answer that is going to be. Yeah. But I want to delve in a little bit to find out, like, how is that possible and what can we do? Well, to- well the answer is yes. But but how is how is everything? And I've I've talked about this for years. Um, you know, we just had um, one of the libertarian candidates on the show um, who's running for president and the problem with third parties is that the, the playing field between the two parties, the duopoly, the Republicans and the Democrats, they, for instance, they have immediate ballot access. Mm-hmm. Um, if RFK created a party tomorrow, he would have to spend an insane amount of money without any guarantee of success to get on the ballot on, in all the 50 states. I, I think every state has different rules for this, but it's not like he can just show up on election day unless you think, magically a write-in candidate is is going to win a majority i i think i think it's virtually impossible under the current rules for a non-republican non-democrat to win but that system is going to break and the question is when yeah and i've i've pointed to these candidates you know you could go back to certainly ron paul and certainly bernie sanders and and donald trump to a great extent he at least broke the republican primary system so something's going to break. And this was a long time ago, but Ross Perot was pretty successful as a third-party candidate back in the day. And then they changed the rules. And they changed the rules, yeah. Uh, because they're like, we're not going to let that happen again. Right. So like, I forget what the number was. I believe you needed 5% in the polls to get on the presidential debate stage. And was that 1980? Yeah, Ross Perot was later than that. He was 92, I think. Um, whenever it was. It was yeah. a long time ago. And... By the time Gary Jan- Johnson came along, the, the the bar had been raised substantially to the point where someone that's not on the presidential stage can't poll at 10 or 15 percent in order to get on the presidential stage. Yeah. Now, well, you know what's different right now, and I think RFK gets this and, and, and Ramaswamy gets this, is they're, they're not um, running a traditional let's get on meet the press and, and pitch the, the people on this thing. They're, they're going on Rogan. And they're very comfortable in these this open world of, of influencer media. Um, so I, I again, I think it's going to happen. I, I hope it's the libertarians that break through. They, yeah. They're the ones that have been working at it the longest. Um, we have no idea who the libertarian candidate for president will be. Um, at the at at the moment, they don't have any big names um, um, in the race, and so. I don't know. It's it's going to be something. It is probably going to be something unexpected that happens. I feel like it has to be, and it has to be sort of a stealth campaign because it seems like all those times in the past you mentioned are people who kind of snuck up on the two parties without them noticing. Like when Trump won in 2016, I feel like he won because everyone thought he had no chance of winning. And so they didn't. They let their guard down. And like I, the reason I don't think Trump is going to win this year is because I think they're, they're all prepared for him. And they, they know what coming. they're they're not going to underestimate him a second time yeah. or a third time. Um, so I feel like he's got a real uphill battle in that sense. So somehow someone has to sneak under the radar to do this. I think they're focused on RFK. And I think all yeah. the, the hysteria and the, the mono media um, takedown of RFK tells me that that's who they think might break the system. Interesting. Yeah, maybe. Well, let's move on and talk about something a little lighter than the election. Let's talk about the movies. Let's talk about Barbenheimer. Because you went to see the Barbie movie. That's not lighter. That's more That's more. No, depressing. it's, it's yeah. great. Um, I like that people are going back to the movies again. I love movies, and it's great that people are actually back in theaters. I think the whole phenomenon is fascinating, that there was this like hilarious double feature that had nothing to do with each other, and it got people back in theaters again. We had Jeffrey Harmon on the show a few weeks ago talking about people going back to theaters. Um, and you saw the Barbie movie, and I saw Oppenheimer. So I wanted to get your take on uh, the Barbie movie, and then I have a couple questions about Oppenheimer for you from the viewers. Before I, before I saw either one, I, I, I made a joke on Twitter about um, the two movies I want to see. One is about nuclear winter, and the other is is about a dystopian apocalypse. And I'm not sure which one is going to be which. Right. And I, I went in, we Terry and I went to see Barbie, and I went in um, with most of the uh, libertarian opinionators that I respect telling me this was a good movie. Um, they really liked it, and they pushed back against uh, against the guys at the Daily Wire that were saying that this was a, a woke train wreck. And I, I really hated the movie. I hated everything about it. Um, I don't 
I don't know much about Barbie, and maybe I'm not their their target demographic. I'm guessing that's true. I don't think there's a lot of deep Barbie lore that you had to know going in in order to get it, though. Yeah, I think they sort of made it up in yeah. the movie. Um, but the thing I hated was has nothing to do with what Ben Shapiro hated. The thing I hated was I thought it was the most anti-feminist movie that I'd ever seen. Like, um, the women, um, with the exception of the one mom, are all caricatures, and Barbie herself is is a made up thing, right? She's she's been created by by these the white patriarchy at Motel, at Mattel, and um, she never ever sort of um, takes control of her own life, and 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 that was very disappointing to me. And of course, the men are also um, caricatures, and and the, neither one gave gave due to what I think is a really interesting question about 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 how the sexes um, get get along in this day and age. And it, it, it became trite, and this will be a spoiler if you haven't seen Barbie. Miguel, have you seen Barbie? Are you gonna see Barbie? No, no you're not gonna see Barbie. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. I was vaguely interested in going to see it as part of the double feature, and then I heard a lot of negative things about it, and I ended up not going. And then after that, I heard a lot of positive things about it, and I thought maybe I should go, and then I heard more negative things. So I don't know. It's interesting because I have like so many friends who have wildly different opinions about it. People yeah. I respect and people I trust. Some people say it's just complete garbage. Some people say it's just tons of fun and they loved it. And like, I don't know who to believe. I guess I should see it for myself and decide, but it's, I usually don't see that kind of difference of opinion among people I respect. Well, well I thought it would be tons of fun and maybe we can't see anything as just fun anymore. And that would be the critique of what I just said. But, but I maintain this was absolutely a message movie. Yeah. Um, this wasn't a fun movie because the, because I used the patri the word patriarchy at least a dozen times, probably two dozen times. Um, the daughter of the one mom um, uh, does the obligatory screed against capitalism, and 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 everything is just is. In, and even January six is in there because there's a there's an attempted takeover of the yeah. Supreme Court and all that stuff. Um, so I'm like, if if it's a political movie, I gotta filter it through a political lens. If this was a fun movie. I didn't laugh once, so I, I don't know. I, di I didn't like it. This is sort of an occupational hazard of what we do, I think, is that it becomes impossible to view media without putting that political lens on it. Yeah. And I know in this case it's particularly hard because it's a, objectively a political movie, but like I've seen things that I've come away thinking, oh, that was so obviously a political movie, and I have friends who are like couldn't see it at all, completely blind to it. They thought, I don't, I don't know where you're getting that from. So it's interesting. But um, I did see Oppenheimer, which I know you haven't seen yet. And I thought it was really good. I didn't think it was as good as everyone else thought it was, but I enjoyed it. Um, and it's got a really interesting... I like that it didn't um, hammer home, like, one of two messages. It didn't hammer home completely like nuclear weapons are evil and bad and these people who created it should be ashamed of themselves. And it also didn't hammer home the rah-rah patriotism that we beat Japan and Germany good for us. It sort of had a little bit of moral ambiguity, a little bit of gray area in the middle, which I really appreciated. But one of our viewers, Rachel Ferguson, has written in and asked about um, Thomas Sowell was defending the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And there's a lot of, I've heard a lot of defenses of that bombing on the grounds of it ended the war quick, quickly, more people would have died if we hadn't done it. And she was surprised to hear Thomas Sowell make this defense because he's, you know, quasi-libertarian. And she wanted to know your thoughts on that bombing and Thomas Sowell's uh, defense of it. Yeah, like I, I, I knew the Thomas Sowell and, um, and, and others like him are what I would call classic, uh, classical liberals. And they, they, they're far more conservative, traditional Republicans on foreign policy. It does, so it doesn't surprise me if Thomas Sowell made that argument. My instincts are the opposite of that. And, and when you dig just a little bit into the decision to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you, you discover that um, then General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who we all know is the guy that warned us against the military industrial complex, yeah. argued at the time that um, Japan was already beaten and it was completely unnecessary 
and a horrific idea. And I, I think I think that historical context only strengthens my instinct to say that um, you know slaughtering um, tens of thousands of 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 innocents is not how the United States, at least, should conduct war. And I, I feel like that's that's part of the the ethos that we at least pretend to to advance. That that when we're talking about about war, now peop, uh, libertarians are going to quickly point out that that um, you know every president since then has been guilty of 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 killing innocent people in the name of of defending America. Yeah. But. But the the thing that that struck me when you when you dig into the Manhattan Project, which was this vast government um, government works program, um, that it reminds me a little bit of whatever we're calling this this. Um, it's not the pandemic industrial complex because that that is all of this infrastructure that rose up from the emergence of the virus. But as we get into the to to, to Fauci's double dealings, we're discovering that there is something that goes back to to 9-11 where the U.S. government has, has built this vast clandestine program yeah. to create gain-of-function viruses and then come up with a solution to those gain-of-function viruses, all in the name of keeping us safe should somebody else create a super virus through gain-of-function research. And, and what's, what's ironic about it is, um, one, it leaked out, and and killed a lot of people and two we were doing this in china presumably one of 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 the countries that we're protect we're supposedly protecting ourselves from because there was a obama administration ban on gain of function so they went they went around it but it 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 reminds me of the manhattan project in a lot of ways because we ended up creating this this thing that could be the end of all of us should should we slip should something bad happen, and I, I think I think as libertarians we should be wildly skeptical that we could ever trust government with that much power. Yeah, the argument I've always heard and I've always never understood is, um, you know, Japan was never going to surrender, so it was either a choice of dropping the bomb to make them surrender or invading uh, with a ton of American troops and cut, taking over the whole country. And I always thought, couldn't we just like do nothing? Like, what is Japan going to do? They're going to keep sending planes over to Hawaii the rest of their lives? Right. And we can just shoot them down? It seems like we could have just, like, fallen back and said, okay, Germany's done. You're basically defeated. Why do we need to keep fighting? But I guess that was politically unpalatable at the time. But it's, I'm not a foreign policy expert, so perhaps it's a naive question, but I never understood that. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this as well, but we didn't bomb one city. We bombed two. Yeah. And um, we also had bombed our own country in New Mexico. And as it's a fascinating article that I read in, uh, in Responsible Statescraft. If, if people interested in foreign policy should absolutely be reading these articles. Um, and it was a story about the forgotten communities in the surrounding area in New Mexico where they tested Oppenheimer's um, bomb. And to this day, there are generations of people that are um, still dying of cancer because of that. And so we, we actually bombed our own people. And, and did we do it out of naivete? Did we do it um, out of hubris? I don't know what it is, but to this day, these people are fighting for um, um, uh, their fair compensation for sure. what, what the government did to them. And again, the, 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 the comparison to um, the COVID virus is, is striking to me because um, as as we've gotten into this, I think I think we I think people with open minds can be fairly confident that our government financed the creation of this virus in Wuhan in Wuhan, China, and it slipped out, and they um, then covered it up. So not only did they kill Americans with their virus, but then they killed Americans by denying the origins of the virus that prevented um, responsible public health people to act responsibly. Are we ever going to get to the bottom of that, by the way. I think we might. Um, we're working on a project right now, as you well know, with Senator Rand Paul. And I, I think that, um, I mean, Rand is, is tweeting that, that he's, he's, um, he's filed charges against Fauci. Is that, is that the w right way to say it? I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, but it goes a lot further in Fauci, and I think everybody's missing the point because this, uh, what is being covered up 
And what keeps diverting our attention away, attention away from things is a Manhattan Project style um, insane science, science experiment where they're harvesting viruses, they're manipulating them, and they're, gonna, they're ostensibly going to create a, a cure for all of, these, all of these super viruses in order to keep us safe. And in the process of doing that, they may well unleash hell on Earth. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Key Beyond Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. So not the optimistic part no, that we were talking about well, earlier. No, well, but since we can all agree that the federal government is evil and does evil things consistently, uh, a Twitter user named Snow Trooper wants to know your thoughts on state nullification and a convention of the states in order of the states getting around the federal government laws and uh, refusing to follow them. My, my favorite project um, in the states right now is something called Defend the Guard. And Defend the Guard is the idea that the National Guard, which is called up at the state level, um, will not be deployed by a governor unless the Congress, as is required on, under the Constitution, actually makes a formal declaration of war. Mm. And, and it gets to this question of these endless wars and authorization of use of military force that's never, ever passed for the purposes um, by which Congress and the president use them. So I like the idea of the states, t- states taking that power back because without, without the soldiers, they can't do a lot of the things that they aspire to do. Um, the, you know, nullification has, has some baggage, and I, I always think of uh, uh, Martin Luther King's um, famous I Have a Dream speech, yeah. where he's, he's complaining about, I believe, the governor of, of Alabama and his thoughts of nullification. But I think both... Um, Republicans and Democrats have acknowledged that nullification is a good thing. Um, you know, uh, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, came out after the really bad Supreme Court decision that said that the, the Biden administration vaccine mandate on healthcare workers could stand and said, I'm not doing that. Right. That's nullification. Um, uh, conversely, or, or similarly, a lot of blue state um, mayors and governors um, defied the Trump administration with so-called sanctuary cities yeah. um, to to house illegal immigrants. It's it's become sort of comical now because all of those those mayors and governors now are declaring an emergency because they didn't mean it. Right, right. They didn't actually want to help those people. They just um, they just wanted to score political points. But but both of those are examples of nullification. And I like I like competition. I like challenge to federal power. And I like um, to take it even a step further because I think ultimately, it's not about the it's not about states' rights; it's about individual rights. Right, and so yeah, there's obviously a danger of states ignoring the federal government in order to violate individual rights, which is something we have to be careful of. But I also think I, I'm uh, reminded of this quote that Thomas Massey gave in this uh, film we recently made, and one in the word for everyone is welcome. And in that film, Thomas Massey says. If the order is unconstitutional, the only constitutional thing to do is to defy it. And I think that's that's where we are on state nullification. If the federal government's making states do things that violate their violate the federal constitution or violate the state constitution, they shouldn't be obeying them. And by the way, peaceful defiance is is the reason that you could be white pilled and optimistic about the future because no tyrant, um, no government, no dictator can ever control people who will not be controlled. Um, and the challenge is, and I, this is why I was so disappointed in the, in the lockdown years, yeah. is so few people were willing to defy authority. Um, but once somebody does it, then a couple people join him, and pretty soon you have a majority of the population just um, uh, saying, I'm, I'm not doing that. Yeah, authority rests on the consent of the governed, as Barbie said in the Toy Story movies. <laughs> So okay, we brought so, it right back to Barbie. So you're going to rehabilitate Barbie. You um, know, that's the, the Toy Story Barbie is better than the Mattel Barbie, it turns out. Okay. So we figured that out. Yeah. 
Um, we have a question from a Twitter user called Uber Geek about what do I tell my friends when they ask questions like uh, who's going to fund the military if we stop stealing you from you uh, in the form of taxation? How are we going to have society funded? And this is always a difficult question for people to answer. And I know I, I never know whether you consider yourself a minarchist or an anarchist and you refuse to label yourself, which is fine. But, um, you know, for those of us like myself who consider themselves anarchists and say there should be no taxation whatsoever, the question of how we fund major projects like interstate highways or the military or all these sorts of things is one that people always are pestering me with. So do you have an answer to that question? So the it's it's funny that that debate is 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 always fun to me. Are you a minarchist or an anarchist? And, and and maybe some viewers don't even know what those words are because at least minarchist is a made up word. Yeah. Um, all but, words are made up. But I think I think we could look at the current current state of the military industrial complex and and hopefully all agree we should be doing a lot less. Um, and and by a lot less I mean um, let's start with an eighty percent cut. Right. We let's try to do that first. And I and going back to the the Manhattan Project, um, the second article in in Responsible Statescraft, and you can just you can just Google Oppenheimer on their website and find these pointed out that the Manhattan Project created a vast expansion of the military industrial complex. And, and the number that he used said that in the United States alone, ever since the dropping of the atomic bomb, we have spent $12 trillion in this country alone building nukes and all the apparatus that goes with yeah. that. So you end up with this, this, this vast um, set of interests that, that sort of feed on the financing of that and, and make it worse and worse and worse. So I, I would rather um, radically cut the military's budget so that they would have to responsibly figure out what not to do. And, and their problem right now is that there's no constraint on what they're doing. And, and the Republicans are most guilty of this, although Biden doesn't seem to have any problem just throwing more and more money into the military. But if if you have no constraints, um, you're always going to go back to Congress and say, I'm desperate for more money. We mm. must fully fund America's security. And and it's all it's all corrupt. Yeah, this is sort of the problem, I think, where people always want to argue all or nothing. And it's like if we argue about, well, let's reduce the military budget. I think the same people who are attacking us for saying there shouldn't be taxation would agree with us on that. And we could like work together to solve that problem, but instead they're like, "Oh, you don't want any military, or you don't you, you don't want uh, any taxation, therefore you're my enemy." Well, can't we just like agree on something and say, "Yeah, there should be a little bit less military spending," and argue in in terms of that direction? But for some reason, people don't want to do that. No, and it it like we we should um, stop fighting with each other until we get to that point where we're debating about what to do with the last ten percent of the federal government. Right. That would be a cool part. Yeah, if, we, if we're at the point where like I'm um, ten percent taxation rather than forty or whatever it is now, like we can kind of peacefully coexist there. Maybe we can argue about whether we should go down to nine percent or go up to eleven percent. But like let's get there first before we fight about it. But I should say without government, I have no idea who will build the roads. No. Well I think that's sort of the point in as far as I'm concerned, is if you know how everything should be arranged, you might as well be a statist and say, I'll just put me in charge. I'll arrange everything. I, I've got it. And I think the humility of libertarians is that we don't know how everything should be arranged. And we think that there are people out there who are smarter than us. There's hundreds of millions of people in this country. And if we just let them work on the problem, maybe they'll come up with something we haven't thought of yet. Yeah. There were roads before government and there will be roads after the government stops financing it. And there's obviously all sorts of beautiful innovations with, uh, with tolling a technology that, that could be used to, to um, produce better transportation at a fraction of the cost. But again, it's about control. It's not about efficiency. Yeah. So we now come to my favorite question of the night, which someone asked on Facebook. Um, when I first met you, for viewers of this show who may be a little bit more recent to knowing about you, when I first met you, you had these glorious mutton chops that came down the side of your face, it's much like uh, the President Chester A. Arthur had, something yeah. like that. And uh, then you met me, and then mysteriously after that, you grew a handlebar mustache. I'm sure there's no connection between those two things, but just a coincidence. Um, and one of their Twitter, one of our uh, Facebook followers, excuse me, said, uh, "When are we going to see a return of the mutton chops, if ever?" So, if if anyone watches, I just watched this last night, which is why it's on my mind. If anybody watches uh, um, the what is it called, the fabulous gemstones, the righteous gemstones, HBO special starring Danny McBride. Mm -hmm. 
and Danny McBride has these ridiculous mutton chops that he dyes black because they're 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 white, right? Because because he's um, he's a he's a phony. Um, if I brought the mutton chops back, they would be snow white, and it just wouldn't have the same effect. But my my favorite story about about the mutton chops and the reason that I actually kept them is I. I was uh, I, had, I had grown a beard and and it was it was shocked it's not nearly as white as, as it is now but when I was growing this beard I was shocked at how much gray was in my beard yeah and and I shaved all the the, the gray off and I was left with these with these sidebar mut- mutton chops and I went on TV I think it was MSNBC because it triggered this this unhinged rant against my mutton chops. By Keith Olbermann. Oh yeah, well, he named you second worst person in the world. If I second worst per- person in the world, he hated my my sideburns, and I, at that point, I knew that I had to keep them, and I kept them throughout the Tea Party years after that. Yeah, that's a good reason. To spite Keith Olbermann is a good reason to yeah. do anything. I still hope for the return of a presidential candidate with facial hair, because it's been since William Howard Taft since we've had a president with facial hair. I think that it's time to return to that standard. We maybe would solve some of our problems. People with facial hair are probably more friendly to liberty in general. So I'm trying to think if there's a single candidate that has facial hair right now. The last one I remember was Herman Cain. Yeah. It's been a while. And we had our chance. Yep. We didn't take it. Is there anything else on your mind that you'd like to discuss that you want to get off your chest before we conclude this wonderful conversation? I anything th- to plug? Anything to plug? Um, I don't know. What are we doing? We're doing lots of stuff. We got a lot of irons in the fire. We so but we don't have any. I guess um, I'm trying to think of the things that are imminently to be released, and and the latest, of course, is is the project we're doing with Lou Perez, comedy is murder. Yes, we have we have the um, magnum opus um, ultimate Lou statement coming out um, imminently. I'm not even going to say what it is because I think Lou oh, would it be should up- be a surprise, definitely. Yeah, Lou would Lou would be upset if we said what it was. Um, we have we have another um, um, bigger comedy project coming out, and I don't think I'm going to tease that one either. We're planning a premiere of that in D.C. in within the next month or so, I believe. So that should be cool. Yes. So so we've gotten into comedy as we've talked about on this show. Um, we are working on a documentary with Rand Paul, trying to get to the bottom of the cover up, and and it's 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 most difficult to do because um, you keep learning new things every day and and at some point we're gonna have to stop making it and just release it but i i I, as you know i feel so passionately that we must 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 get to the bottom of what happened because i very much believe they're going to do it again i saw an article today that said there's a new strand of COVID 19 and cases are rising again so you know they're they're definitely ramping up to do it again probably sooner than we think so i agree with you on that completely it's just like the military industrial complex and the, the aftermath of the Manhattan Project. You build this vast network of interests who have a financial incentive to keep the fear going. So the fear of our enemies, the fear of an unknown virus, and now they're, now they're trying to convince us that global warming is, is going to kill us all. Um, it's it's, it's fear mongering with a profit motive to it, which is why it's not going to stop unless we, unless we, we Uh, destroy the premise and for whatever it's worth i know that weather is not climate but we've had a lovely august in dc the best i remember in the last 10 years it was uh it was hillary clinton that tweeted a few days ago um if if you hate the um hot summers and i'm I'm butchering this only slightly if you hate hot summers blame MAGA republicans (laughs) which implies that if she was in charge she could control the weather that is um that is some serious badass shit if she could do it yeah it's a big claim it's a big claim all right well thanks for doing this and i hope our viewers got some value out of it and enjoyed it and i hope that uh let us know in the comments and we'll do it again uh shortly if you want to have more questions for matt cheers cheers thanks for watching if you liked the conversation make sure to like the video subscribe and also ring the bell for notifications and if you want to know more about free the people go to freethepeople.org.